50 years on the rails has broken the back of this GP9 locomotive. She's been rejected, neglected, and written off as scrap. Using cranes, chains, and firepower, a team of experts will tear this 109 metric ton moving machine apart. We the breakdown boy. Tear them up, put them together. Then rebuild her as a lean green locomotive machine. Railway Equipment Company. There's nothing here that can't be resold, rebuilt, or recycled. On the docket today is a GP9. Dubbed the Jeep 9. It was built in the 1950s. She's clocked over a million kilometers in her day. Now, she's production supervisor Jim Patton's problem. No, very old. Jim Patton must evaluate this loco from top to bottom, inside and out. There's potential recycling value in all these parts. So it's up to him to figure out what can be salvaged. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look too bad. I can probably rebuild this one. But for this project, Jim determines the mother load isn't the 1,774 metric horsepower diesel engine. Or the equipment rack. Yeah, the equip equipment rack's in good shape. Or even the 109 metric tons of steel and copper. It's the frame. I just want the center. The meat of the locomotive, which is the frame. The structural part's all I want. Because that's all Jim needs to transform a broken down relic into a locomotive of the future. Shut these doors again real quick. For the breakdown and rebuild project, the company's budgeted 4,000 man hours. Anything over that eats up the profit margin. It's kind of jagged at the bottom. Jim needs this loco in pieces in just five days. And for that, he needs manpower. A mixture of experienced old timers like Kenny Lucas. We the breakdown boy. Tear them up, put them together. Send me those two rookies down into Bay 3. And a couple of youngsters to do the heavy lifting. They're part of the team of Teardown. It's a lean crew with a hefty task. All together, we're five. We done did this a couple of times together, so we kind of know how to work with each other. We know what everybody can do, and we'll assign everybody to the job that they can best do. When Jim's finished with this, it'll be a whole new beast. A lean, mean pulling machine. But before you build it up, you've got to break it down. The breakdown will happen from the top down in three steps. Step one, the strip down. Cut and skin the outer steel shell of the loco to expose its innards. Step two, the gut out. Remove the locomotive's internal organs, the engine, generator, and cab. And step three, the final breakdown. Strip the frame down to bare steel, leaving only the trucks and wheels. At National Railway Equipment Company, breaking down locos is only half of what they do. CEO Lawrence Beale and his son Stephen built a one-of-a-kind company. That's how you got to start. That's, he was buying locomotives and just scrapping them out and selling the parts bit by bit. That's, that's what he, all he wanted to do. Yeah, I intended to work out of my basement at home. So. <laughs> Today, their 25-year-old business includes full-scale production. Oh, yeah, we remanufacture the locomotives. That's exactly what these are. They were used locomotives that we bought, and then we remanufactured them, and when we're done, they're pretty well new. This 10-hectare lot in Mount Vernon, Illinois, is home to about 100 locomotives. 
and they are waiting for the chance to get rebuilt and back on the rails. And right now, it's time to make over the Jeep 9. The crew gets straight to work on the first step, the strip down. First up, remove the steel hood, a steel membrane that stretches from the cab back over the main components. National Railway Equipment Company can sell it as scrap or reuse the structure, so the team wants it off in one piece. This metal behemoth was designed to be indestructible. So it's going to take heavy duty torch power and muscle, which isn't enough for Shane Laird and his wrench. He's forced to call in help. We got this pipe in the way, and we're gonna have Tim come over here and cut it out for us. Have fun, buddy. You crawl in the hole now. The experienced guys get the torches, for good reason. This beast may be metal, but she's far from fireproof. Over the decades, a noxious coating of grease, oil, and debris worked its way deep into her body. A blast of flame in the wrong spot could ignite a fire. The base of the hood along the engine is a danger zone. There's a grease pan under the 16-cylinder block, and the unit is still swimming in engine oil. 50, 100, about 250 gallons. The team pumps it dry before they cut anywhere near it. You know, you figure if you got a clean work environment with less hazards, you got less chance of people getting hurt. With one major fire hazard out of the way, the cutters keep torching their way along the base of the frame. team is ready to pull the hood. For that, they'll need some lifting power. Cranes. We're going to use a 30-ton, and we're going to use this, uh, what is it, 10-ton right here. Taking some chains onto it and pick him up for you. Up, up, and away. But not until Mike Gargas says so. I'm the guy that's going to be running the overhead cranes, so... Whenever I come in and I, I inspect the whole locomotive before I pull the long hood. Mike must make sure the long hood is in good enough condition to lift off in one piece. The last thing he wants is 4,500 kilograms of rusted steel plate collapsing on the workers. A few bolts on this side, a couple bolts on that side. Okay. A few cracks in the long hood that we'll have to get it taken care of and everything before we can pull the long hood so it don't fall apart as we pull it up. Okay. Mike finds cracks that he's concerned could tear apart in the lift, so he calls in the welders to try and reinforce the weakest points. Over the years, it has acquired a lot of rust, a lot of cracks, even when it was moving. You know, a lot of times they get stress cracks and things like that. We have to be very careful because we don't want to take anything off that when we lift it, it have a chance of breaking. It's more of a safety procedure than anything else that don't nothing fall apart. The hood can only be reused if it's in one piece. But try as they might, it looks too risky. They come up with a new plan. There are too many cracks in the hood to take it off in one piece. So the team decides to take it off in two pieces. With them cracks up on the hood and everything, it's just, it's not real safe. As they work to cut the hood in two, the boss checks in for a final inspection. He gives the okay for liftoff of the first piece. 
Mike begins his trek up to the crane. It's a five-story hike, so he's up here till the hood's off. If the team missed a bolt or didn't torch all the way through, this loco will try to hold on to its skin. Is everybody out of the way? Something isn't right. The long hood is stuck. They're gonna have to comb through the entire hood to locate what's holding it down. The locomotive breakdown team can't find the cause of the lift holdup. 20 minutes later, they discover it's just one single bolt that's delaying the entire operation. It happens sometimes. Have things stuck, new pieces been added, think you have everything out, it don't. And some of the knucklehead don't take all the bolts out. <laughs> then a knucklehead didn't take all the bolts out. Penny. Yeah. No, it's all right. It's, it's all right? It's all right. Oh, okay. Okay. They try again. first section is done. Because they had to cut the hood in two, Jim can't reuse it. But it's still worth about 970 euros in steel scrap. Now, the second piece of the hood. Stage one of the breakdown is complete. Now they can move on to the gut out. Removing the components, including the massive 1,774 metric horsepower engine. Since the 1930s, many locomotives have been powered by a combination of mechanical and electrical technology. At the core, a supersized diesel engine. That runs a generator, which creates enough electricity to power the air compressors needed to run all its vital organs, as well as the wheel-turning traction motors. Jim's got a schedule to keep. Right now we're on schedule. I hope to continue on schedule. But he doesn't want them to rush it. I can't hear the blood. They've got to remove each component while trying to keep its auxiliary parts intact. Radiator's a bit of a struggle. This essential 453 kilogram component cools the engine as needed. And Jim can resell it for almost a hundred euros. continues but then a problem arises oh lordy shane finds a fuel leak below the air compressor it's residual diesel from the old fuel lines he plugs the leak the old-fashioned way until they can get a cover on it nobody let a spark hit that 
it could light up a fire in no time. Anytime you have oil build up like that, you have to be prepared. Always be. That should be one of your first items you bring to the table as your safety equipment. Crisis averted. They unhook the air compressor. The air compressor creates pressurized air, which locomotives use to brake, release sand, and even blow the horn. It will be a good candidate for rebuild. It's time to prep for lifting the engine. Wrenches won't do diddly on this beast. All up. And that's ready to go. This 16-cylinder powerhouse has some of the biggest bolts on the locomotive. This is a spline drive. It takes out the bolts that don't want to come out with nothing else. These spline drives tackle the toughest jobs using 2,400 Newton meters of torque. Ain't too many bolts it won't take out. But it's not just the bolts they have to remove. They must cut old fuel lines connected to the engine through the bottom of the frame. The smallest on the team gets assigned this dirty duty. The smallest, but the best looking. But gotta finish cutting this in half, so when we pull the engine, the pipe doesn't hook up, so it just pull out clean. Got a little bit here left to cut, and then this will be done. It's a messy job, but someone's gotta do it. With the arteries cut, Mike heads to the main surgery ward. They're ready for operation. Fourteen thousand kilograms of steel is hoisted into the air as the crane rips this loco's heart out. I'm bringing west. North a little. Take it Rebuilt. The engine could be worth up to 120,000 euros and run another 50 years on the rails. Good. But this loco's gonna get something much more powerful. A genset engine. These things will be Lawrence and Stephen Beale are pioneers in a new locomotive technology. To make them more green and efficient. So we strip them down to the deck and we build them back up with the new the new technology, the multi-engine technology for emissions and fuel savings. The key concept is to replace the massive one-engine power system with a series of smaller units. Genset technology, short for generator set, focuses on fuel efficiency. Instead of using one large engine and generator all the time at full capacity, a series of smaller engines and generators are used only when needed. An onboard computer monitors the horsepower and starts and stops the engines accordingly. If a lot of power is needed, all of them kick in. Otherwise, the rest stay off. The result? Over a 35% reduction in fuel consumption and more than 85% fewer emissions of some greenhouse gases. Production supervisor Tom Bonner oversees the genset operation. Viral motives is what we call them. In other words, their, their fuel efficiency is much greater. Their, their uh, sound decibels, dBs, is much lower. What we've done is uh, basically rewrite how locomotives are being made and produced. Uh, the whole concept of what a locomotive is, we've changed it and they're about to change this locomotive. But before they build her back up, the breakdown boys have to remove one last component, the Locos Operational Center, the cab. The team is down to Kenny and Tim, and they've got a tough task to complete. The electrical cabinet is the hardest part on getting this cab off. No rookies today. 
This is a dangerous operation. This loco cab is comprised of the nose, the driver's console, and an electrical cabinet, which is basically the back wall of the cab, all welded tight together. And it's full of insulation and electrical wiring. The team's goal is to remove the cab in two lifts. First, the nose and driver's console. Then, the electrical cabinet. But before they can get to work, Kenny's got to get rid of four 90 kilogram batteries from the bottom of the cab. He opts for the forklift because the batteries are an extreme fire hazard when near torches. The danger of the battery is the chemicals that's in it. You know, they, um, it'll, it'll explode. Okay, we're gonna have to do a little bit more cutting on that before it come out. Don't wanna bust them. The batteries are fused to the cab. Kenny's forced to take out the torch. and resell these batteries. Now, it's time to rock and roll. Let's get her done. Ay, 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 ay. Kenny and Tim set about cutting apart the cab. It's in bad shape, but they finally cut it free. They're ready for the first lift. For this, the team hooks up her nose and threads padded chains through the driver's console. too much of an angle pulling on that hook. Jim doesn't think it's safe to lift. So they re-thread the chains to distribute the weight more evenly. All 7,000 kilograms of it. All right, Maggie, up slow. Up slow. Oh, 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 cabinet's coming with it. Set it down. Set it down. This beast won't budge. Something's not right. All the boats are out of there. It's got to be welded somewhere. Okay, we well, Let's check it out real quick. The electrical cabinet is somehow still attached, but the plan is to lift that separately. Can we get it from up under? Yeah, probably. But it's going to take a while to get this cabinet loose. Cabinet's pulling up. I know. I know. Yeah, but you Why? get up in the air and something give way. Yes, I'm, I'm, not, no, I'm not taking a chance now. I'm not going to be unsafe. We can put some more boats back in there. Throw some boats back in them holes. Hey, we, we got boat holes. Go put some boats in it. But I want a lot of boats in it. Jim reluctantly agrees to the option of last resort. Try to pull it all free in one lift. But first, he wants the electrical cabinet reinforced to the cab. What we need, about 10 of them? No, you need about 20 of them. Another setback on schedule. It's gonna be a little while before we pull this. Look on my top box and give me that three-quarter socket and that uh, three-eight drive ratchet. Tim and Kenny screw in 20 bolts by hand. Hopefully, 
This will secure the electrical cabinet to the driver's console. Okay, Mikey, we ready? There you go. go up. Call it. Man. She ain't going quietly. Kenny? Mike, fix yours up some more. Go ahead. The strategy works. Nose, driver's console, and electrical cabinet break free in one piece. That's why I said headache. And Jim's team is back on schedule. good day today. Now if we can get the rest of this stuff off, get it on cleaned up a little bit, it'll be ready for rebuild. With the gut out complete, it's time for the final step of the breakdown. They have to get the frame flawless, otherwise they won't be able to build it up, because you can't weld on top of rust. It's like going to the dentist except these guys use torches to rid the plaque. And there's a lot of it. It will take them days of sanding, cutting, and scraping to get it ready for rebuild. It's taken Jim's breakdown team just five days to tear this Jeep 9 apart. All that's left is their 17 meter long base frame. In the next seven weeks, this frame will undergo a total transformation as it's rebuilt into a new locomotive with the latest and greenest technology. But first, they've got to move her. Everything looks good. I'd say let's roll it out of here. When you have a yard full of locos, it's a full-time job getting units from point A to B. That's where Tom Boswell and Hubert Carter come in. Their specialty, switching. Keep on rolling my way. With a hundred locos and only six and a half kilometers of track, these guys have to switch one out to move one forward. This is like the chess game where we have to move them all around in order to get to where we're going. You, know, you always got to think ahead and you know, I got to remember where this is at or maybe put this one over here and double back and grab these two. And at first it's kind of hard, but you know, once you do it for a while. All right, let's go my way. On average, Tom and Hubert move more than one million kilograms of locos per day. I let him know what's going on on the ground, and he does what I tell him to do so nobody gets hurt. That's what it boils down to. And I trust what he does, and he trusts what I tell him, so <laughs> that's how we get along and don't get ran over. Because <laughs> you can't stop a locomotive real quick. Yeah, yeah it, it don't stop on a dime. Keep on rolling my way. It's all about communication. A lot of times I'll honk, honk to respond so he knows I heard it instead of getting on the radio all the time. Yeah, these guys in these buildings always complain because I usually got the bell ringing all the time and I blow the horn a couple times, but, but it's better to be safe, you know. Today's game plan, get the stripped frame to the cleanup bay. All right, take it to the blaster room. Take it to the blaster room. And into the hands of Brad Kelly. He's going to strip this 50-year-old frame down to the bone. When they come in the gate, they're nasty, oily, greasy, rusty pieces of equipment. And by the time we're done with them, it takes a long time, but by the time we're done, they're a beautiful piece of equipment. Look like they're brand new. 
The cleanup bay is like a car wash on steroids. Here, they coat the frame with degreasing chemicals, then blast it with water at a scorching 82 degrees Celsius. When she's good and soaked, they push her into the sanding room. Here, they buff her clean with tiny rock-like pellets made out of coal slag. It strips away the material and all the rust off of it, makes a nice clean surface for the paint to stick, primer to stick. Ferlin Whittington shoots this out of a blast nozzle at 620 kilopascals. The paint rips right off. This scrub down can be seriously risky. At this force, these tiny particles could literally put a hole in you. It'll blast through your skin a lot quicker than it does that paint. It'll go lucky I've done it 11 years and I haven't had it happen to me. <laughs> but I've seen it probably a half a dozen other guys that it's ate them up pretty good. The frame's new and improved skin is now ready for pickup. Once more around the yard, but this time into building three. This is where the transformation takes place. The buildup will happen from the bottom up in three steps. Step one, the frame fabrication. Remove the wheels, balance the load, and attach the coupler and end sheet. Step two, the body buildup. Place all the locomotive's organs on the frame, the electrical cabinet, cab, and gensets. Step three, the hookup. Connect all the air and electrical lines and give her some wheels and a brand new paint job. Jim has seven weeks to complete the job in order to stay on budget and schedule. First, they need to lift the frame off the wheel assemblies. Out come the wheels, and in go the temporary stilts. These 7,484 kilogram wheel frames, called trucks, are one of the best examples of recycling. Built in the 1940s, these bad boys are continuously used and reused. In fact, trucks like this are no longer even manufactured because with a little upkeep, they last forever. The team will refit the wheels with new traction motors ready for another 50 years on the tracks. Jim's finally got his frame, stripped clean and primed to go. Now, the body buildup can begin. In the next few weeks, the crew will build a new locomotive on the old Jeep 9 frame. But before they can put anything on it, they must make sure it can handle the load. A loco is designed to be heavy, to keep it on the tracks. This frame must weigh 23,000 kilograms to have adequate traction. Dick Porter's responsible for making sure that weight is balanced throughout the frame. To do so, he adds ballast, or dead weight. Uh, we have to have pretty well the same amount on the front end as the back end. We've got ballast welded all the way down the side for a little light on the front. So what we do, we've got a sealed compartment on the front. We add steel shot to it and then seal everything with an inch and a half steel plate. The base frame is balanced. Now Dick can start assembling the loco's upper body. I'll be throwing a little bit of dust here. The crew builds the upper framework of their locos from sheets of recycled steel. They've got a CNC plasma cutter on site to slice up sheets according to specification. Dix ordered up a 1,600 kilogram steel end sheet to go on the front of the frame. Engineers program the computer to create the desired cut and let the machine do the rest. The result 
near surgical precision. Now, the end sheet can be secured to the frame. It must line up exactly over the space for the coupler. As always, project manager Jim Patton's got a hand on it. And it's this side, he's come up just about a three sixteenths of an inch. Putting it on is the easy part. It's the adjusting that really matters. Because every millimeter counts. Especially when it comes to the coupler. Next step, install the couplers. All locomotive and train cars have a coupler on the front and back so they can interlock. Right. Now go up. If they don't line up exactly, the trains cannot connect. You gotta have your knuckle at a certain height on front and back with locomotives and the train cars, and they won't hook up. You'll have a big problem then. With the frame ready to go, it's time for step two: the body buildup. Place all the locomotive's new and improved organs on the frame. The electrical cabinet needs to sit square at the back of the cab area. Jim's there to make sure it's positioned exactly right. I have to trim that lip. Both sides need to go your way about three-eighths of an inch. The team must precisely position every component. If the measurements are off by a fraction, the final part won't fit, which means taking it apart and rebuilding it again. And right now, Chris Bledsoe is struggling with the nose. Pretty crooked. The way they got the lift and ice set up there, it ain't gonna pick up straight. It seems to just be a matter of getting the nose level. Say, we'll get it in there. <laughs> Kevin Villareal's got it covered. We need uh, basically uh, four, one eye bolt on every corner and four different chains so it'll lift straight up and come straight in and level it out. Kevin welds on new lift hooks evens up the chains. One, two, three, four. And Chris tries for another landing. Little more. Oh, perfect! In she goes. Now they've got to secure it. And that means welding. Welding involves a fine steel wire fed out the end of a tube, while at the same time, a bolt of electricity shoots through it. It melts the wire on contact into a steel puddle, creating an incredibly strong bond. This fuses all the steel together, so it can withstand weight, strain, and weather for another 50 years. No one gets more excited to weld than Mr. Kenny Lucas. This is my girl, Betty. Yeah, this is my baby. She's such a sweetheart. She, she just performs well, you know what I mean? I mean, really. Betty is my welder. My welder. Don't nobody use Betty. My little glove box with my cup holder and thing. My little hooks to hang my leads and welders. I got a storage compartment under the bottom, you know, where I can put all my little gadgets and stuff. With a cart like Betty, Kenny can make metal melt and sparks fly. But if the weld is not done properly, it could jeopardize the entire structure and safety of the locomotive. It's an art. It's got to be an art. You got to be good at it. It's, it's 
structurally, you're taking two pieces of metal and making one solid piece of metal out of it. And if it's got any holes or flaws in it, your structure's not safe. Some welders, they just lay it down and it looks like a machine did it. This is perfect. It's like a beautiful woman, man. It's just perfect. Raymond Scott is one of those welders. I've been doing this for quite a few years. I, I take pride in what I do. And there are multiple welding techniques. There's different motions that you can use. You can use a, a half moon. You can use a circular. You can use what they call like a J pattern. You want to make sure there's a good smooth transition from one to the other. The loco is shaping up pretty nice. With the nose now secured, it's time for the final component to go on. This beast is about to get the ultimate heart transplant. The build-up room is a busy place. With multiple projects constantly underway. But right now, there's only one in the final stage. It's about to receive a revolutionized engine, a gin set. Generator sets are the most important components in the rebuild. With this cutting edge technology, locos are 35% more fuel efficient and emit 85% fewer particulates. It's up to Don Stewart to fly in this second gen set safely. We're gonna set a gen set into this hole. That'll be number two gen set. And uh, hook it up, and you're ready to operate. Using his remote, Don must direct 8,600 kilograms of high-tech machinery into a perfectly fit hole. And at around 200,000 euros per gen set, there's no room for error. About five miles, dude. I don't know about the rest of it. It must align perfectly, or it won't connect with the other parts. We're lining up the holes, uh, our bolts that hold uh, the gin set down. You might have an eighth of an inch clearance, that's it. A few final tweaks. And voila, the team's got the gin set in place. With the heart of the loco installed, this moving machine is now at the forefront of green technology. Pretty soon, she'll be ready to roll, but not until she gets her wheels back. That's where the mechanics come in. They maintain the legs of the loco, truck frames, wheels, and motors. They make them as good as new. Each set of wheels stands exactly 143 and a half centimeters apart, the standard distance between the rails in the United States. When the truck, wheels, and motors all come together, the newly assembled unit weighs almost 18,000 kilograms. But that's nothing compared to what's about to go on top of it. Time to bring in the Mega Jacks. To lift a loco, you gotta have power. Just a little off side to side. These 45 metric ton jacks work as a single unit and operate at exactly the same speed to ensure they lift the loco level. We're going to jack up this locomotive. We're going to put trucks underneath it. I think we're good, Stu. Clear for jack up. They crank up the loco and safely slide in the wheels. Tied up on the belt. So far, Jim's happy with the progress. Uh, we're pretty much on schedule. I'm probably a week behind, but I can make that up. It's on to step three, the hookup. And that starts with the electrical lines. This electrical cabinet controls every single aspect of the locomotive. 
It's basically the brain. Well, everything comes through here, but to blow the horn, it's, a, it's an electrical control that opens the air valve to blow the horn. It'll take electrician Gene Beretta a week straight to connect each and every wire. And concentration is a must. If he gets the wires crossed, the whole lot won't go. While Gene focuses on the wiring, a second team installs the air system. We're just airmen. We run all the airlines and the locomotives for the brakes, the sanders, the horns, the windshield wipers. All that's run on air. Air is like the blood of the locomotive. Several parts require it. These airlines are made out of copper. At around five euros per kilogram, it's a pricey material to work with. I'm just marking this and cut it because we need it to fit perfect. Every airline must be cut, bent, and fit exactly to measure. And there you have it. Soon she'll be ready to hit the rails. However, they're gonna need a bit of juice to finish the job. This forklift carries 11 130 kilogram batteries. The batteries look innocent, but they are alive. <laughs> Unlike previous engine models, the energy-efficient genset automatically recharges these when they are low on energy. Touchdown! Jim's happy. They're in the final lap of the buildup and on schedule. It's finally time to dress her up with some new paint. Ferlin Whittington and his team of painters place stickers over dried orange paint to stencil on the letters of the loco's name. With the stencils in place, now it's time to paint it black. The team suits up for the assignment. And they've learned some tricks of the trade. Uh, putting Vaseline on my face, the part that's open, eyelashes or whatever, you know what I'm saying, because the paint, from the, uh, paint in there, you get paint in your eyes or on your eyelashes, it's hard to get off of your face. And when you get done, you just wipe it off with a towel. I have to scrub on your face or nothing like that. This is our respirator. It's got two charcoal filters in it. One on each side and a three filter on the outside. It keeps the particles out of our lungs. It works pretty good. I'm ready to rock and roll. <laughs> Over the next few days, they spray more than 190 liters of liquid through their blast nozzles. These white stickers will be peeled later on to reveal the orange letters underneath. There's nothing like a brand new paint job. Eight weeks ago, she was a rusty, broken down relic. Today, she emerges as a lean, green, moving machine. Thanks to Stephen Beal and company, with her new genset technology, she'll sail the rails for another 50 years. It makes me extremely happy, yeah. I like watching them go from, from old to new, and uh, just watch it fire up for the first time and move under its own power for the first time. It's amazing every time. And the cycle of loco life continues. Work's done for today. But there's plenty more for tomorrow. Because locos are born to ride.